Uh, this is like all the three shows, which are for artists that have been based in Houston, uh, Houston area for the bulk of their career that have decade long narratives and stories. Um, we started off in these shows as sort of as a showcase and then each one turned in its own way into something not quite a retrospective, but a story of a life. So last night we started at this side, I think let's start with the earliest pieces here. Can you tell me a little bit how you got to that? I was in grad school in England and got really homesick, started making art about the English and they hated it because it's about them. So the, I just decided to go full Texan when I was in England and had a friend whose dad was a professional long haul trucker and he would send me tapes about him <laughs> hitting the cow and its tail getting stuck and rotten and you know and he sent me his jeans and I would play these tapes in my studio in England and um, these pieces came out from there when they showed in London they showed locked and no one even knew so so this is maps of Texas inside yes yeah and whose jeans are we looking at those are Big Billy What's a big Billy? That's his name. Okay. <laughs> and you know what's funny is I assumed because um, his son is in his 50s, I assumed when I dug this out to install it that big Billy had passed, <laughs> just found out he's uh, played 80 rounds of golf last week. So, um, yeah, he's alive. So. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, one, one thing I think is so fascinating about this is the idea of Texasness. Because uh, you grew up, where did you grow up? Um, Eagle Pass, well, Mexico City in Eagle Pass, Texas, and then before that, a lot of other places. Yeah. And how did you end up in London or uh, in the UK? Oxford. Um, I had a professor in um, CCAC who approved of my husband, the boy that I was dating, and um, he had been headmaster at the Ruskin, and um, he, you know, recommended I go there. It was the most different place from Eagle Pass, Texas that I could find. Yeah. And, and that's why I And how it. do they perceive you as a, uh, 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 cause of God only non knows, what? God only knows yeah. what they thought of me. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I went back last September and you get to stay on campus. Once a member of the house, always a member of the house. And I got there and they were mowing the grass is like that perfect and there was one yellow weed, and I ran and got my camera right before the mower hit it, and I'm like, oh, that is so how I felt. So you, you were the one yellow weed at Oxford. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So sticking out. So how did you end up coming back here? Um, Texans always come back. Is that true? Yeah. You, you hit 40, and you're oh, yeah, like... Everyone's nodding, like, yeah. <laughs> I, I, I should explain uh, by preface to this that... I moved here in 2009, and growing up, I grew up in New York City, so the thought that I would end up living and liking Texas was just not something I ever occurred to me. So, and actually one reason I, um, when, when I was looking at what would represent the early Theodore Cool Ledford in the show, I was drawn to this, because the first time I met a Texan was this kiddie, uh, a kid, Jamie Gambrell, who transferred into my junior high school. And he was the most exotic thing we'd ever seen. All of us New Yorkers are like looking at him like, like he's a Texan. What, what, what do they do? You know, can we invite him to parties? Uh, so uh, I, I was thinking. Cal tipping. Yeah, I was thinking of, of that too. So um, the other super early piece we have here, which is not nearly as early as this, is the books. Can you talk a little bit about that? 5,000 trashy romance novels. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> my mom... Um, was a legitimate writer and ran a literary magazine, legit literary magazine. And so one side of her easy boy recliner would have thesaurus and, you know, smart books. She's an academic, I'm not. Um, the other side had these. And so she was like an enigma, like always telling me, oh, don't get married. You know, I married my college sweetheart. And so it was a hidden passion and a hidden, and, and um, this piece is about strength. It, yeah, it's, and then the graphite concrete top, so. Uh, the graphite concrete being uh, a pencil uh, lead writing, writing, writer, writer. yeah. Uh, when we were installing this piece, um, Thedra would pull certain books out that somehow the covers made, me, made her think that I would like this particular one, uh, and she would just open random pages. So we did a few um, energetic readings, uh, and I've never, <laughs> um, 
I've never seen so much sex in my life. Every four pages, someone is thrusting manly energy and stuff. But it's from, it's designed for women. They're totally fascinating. He took four home. Yeah. Well, they were, they were gifts for friends, of course. Oh, of you know. course. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I love literature. I just can't get enough of I it. I know. Yeah. Um, then uh, the work which I first saw when I moved here was the paintings of dolls. And we've got three really prime ones on this wall and two on this wall. Dolls are weird. Um, tell and me, scary. They're scary. They talk about um, roles like Barbie. You no, know, the Barbie with the more realistic doll next to her is still one of the weirdest paintings just because she is so like, what is this creature next to me? Uh, so tell me about, about, about how, why you decided to paint the dolls in this way. It's a great way to talk about my women friends without actually painting portraits of them. Like what kind of women friends? Uh, collectors or? All kinds. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. And um, the lady part part sort of starts here too because when I look at the, um, the hinges of Barbie's crotch, uh, and the idea that that is uh, a representation of women's bodies is really fascinating. Does anyone know what a thigh gap is? I'm sorry, you do. <laughs> the thigh, yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the, um, I, I, so I want to advertise. It's, um, uh, it's, Felice, it's a week from Saturday we're doing the doll drawing. Okay. Um, Come Thad, draw Thad will with be me. Here. They're gonna have a, we noticed that when we would do crafts events for kids, the parents would generally kick the kids out of the room and keep doing the craft projects on their own. So we've started doing a whole series of craft projects for grown-ups. So we've got Scary Doll Drawing Day. Is it 2 o'clock on that Saturday? 2 to 4. And Thedra will be here. And I'm so, going to bring some of my crazy dolls. Yeah. So, uh, uh, and can, people can bring their own dolls. Oh, yes, of course. Want. Please. Yeah. So you were already doing these dolls, looking at gender roles. Actually, can you talk a little bit about the G.I. Joe and Ken doll? Because they're a little bit of an anomaly because it's the only male presence in the room. I locked myself up in my studio and had all my, my girl dolls in, but I also raised boys, so I found a, a Ken doll, and I just thought, they start to talk to you after a while. So I just had to do this, and um, two of my favorite Gay men own this. They've been married 25 years, and um, it's it's GI Joe. Yeah, but um, one appears to have killed the other. Is that a good model for uh, this relationship? Isn't it like um, we, no, each each one kills the thing he loves? I was thinking more of like the the French yeah. sex death. The, the petit more. Okay, and there is also like the big ray gun in the guy's hand too, which is uh, not exactly subtly phallic. I don't know what you're talking about, Bill. Of course. So, uh, okay, you've had a career here with the dolls, then something happens a few years ago that you get diagnosed with breast cancer and because of the type of breast cancer, it was recommended that you get a double mastectomy. And I, on a personal note, she called me and she said, I know I need to make art about this somehow, but I don't want people to think I'm looking for sympathy. I want to do tough art and brave art. And I'm like, well, knowing your work, knowing what you've been doing, you can do this. Tell me about the process of deciding this was good, that your health issue was going to enter your work. Um, basically, you implied, we were sitting next to you, and you kind of said, this is the hand you're dealt. Don't hide it. And I've all, all of my work is always, um, wherever I was at at the time was what I was making. Uh, when I had little ones, I did a, how many gallons of cherry jello, you know? So anywhere, anywhere I was at in my life always came into my life. So I was kind of kidding myself thinking I would be able to separate myself from that during that time period. There would have been no way. Yeah. So I just, and also what really helped getting over it was every day I was laying, on, instead of laying on the couch and net flicking myself into a coma, I, I thought about the, the woman in middle America who sings in the choir at church and can't say fuck cancer. And I thought, I have to make this work for her, um, for them, you know, for the other people. I've already, so it really felt like a calling and um, it, it, 
it was a great feeling to finally feel like you had a calling. It's higher than you, and so you don't think about you, and um, I, it was a, a great way to not even think about yeah. cancer. One of the most powerful, the performance you did a week before your mastectomy at Super Happy Funland was one of the most incredibly powerful things I ever saw. Mm -hmm. You had a, um, a clown mask on, you were kind of sobbing under the mask and doing breast prints. Uh, because you're like, I'm not going to have a nipple in a week. I can do these prints, but they're definitely limited edition. Truly limited edition. <laughs> and you were auctioning them off. And it yeah. was a combination of s deeply sad and incredibly funny and angry and confrontational. And, I, uh, and it was just like one of those nights and I'm sitting there and it wasn't a big crowd. It was maybe like 30 of us there for this performance. And I was like, did I just see that? Uh, I, you know, did I just see someone be that brave in public? Balls to the wall, why not? I mean, yeah, yeah I, I cannot believe I did it still, but I knew I needed to. Um, I had the fake implant shit put in they do it immediately, even before you've gotten your test results back. And um, it stayed infected for three weeks. And during those three weeks, like a splinter trying to get out of your skin, my body was rejecting it. And during that time, I found Flat and Fabulous, this, this, these fabulous ladies that are just like, well, why am I going to put plastic back in my body? That's where the cancer came from, probably. Um, I knew that I needed to research, and I saw this one woman in a photo, and she had paint jeans, and she was rocking it with a tattoo, and she had a red bob, and I'm like, that's it, I can be her. I, so every time I photograph myself um, without my shirt on, it's for someone else out there to see that and know it's okay. Yeah. Well, and the, um, we were in a show, I, I organized a show that was in Sweden, and during the talk there, you said one thing was that the pressure on women to reconstruct is so intense. Women have been taken to court and declared incompetent because not wanting to reconstruct. And you realize that societally, people don't want to be reminded. Cancer is a fact of all of our lives. It's a huge percentage of us will end up dying from cancer. That it's like 34% end up that cancer is what, is what takes us. And um, every time you're out there uh, not um, you know, if, with your uh, uh, post mastectomy body showing, people are reminded, oh yeah, breast cancer is real. This could, no, this can happen. It happens to so many people. Yeah, my doctor has a, a 19 year old and an 11 year old now. Yeah. Yeah, and it's, um, um, I don't know if any of you watch, watch the Ken Burns uh, um, uh, Emperor of All Maladies, the six hour show on the history of cancer. What, what happened to women's bodies, because it was a mainly me male medical establishment deciding that if they were just cut more and more, they could succeed against the cancer. And they only found out a few years ago that's not how cancer works. Things metastasize, and they can appear in other parts of the body. The more cutting more doesn't actually help the cure rate at all. And, but because it was male doctors, uh, there's a, a great, fascinating, tragic story in it that the doctor who had been uh, pushing for more and more radical mastectomies, when he was confronted with the actual statistics that this wasn't saving lives, couldn't change his methodology. He just went to his grave, continuing to, form, to perform really radical mastectomies, because he was convinced somehow he was saving lives. And with this sort of real, uh, with this sort of driven vision. It's a, I've learned more working the show on the history of, of cancer, particularly breast cancer, uh, um, you know, getting involved with this show. The, um, so, you, okay, you have the mastectomy, you've started making new paintings. I think these are the two that are nearest to right after the surgery, right? Because they're the ones yes. which has suck my tits cancer and also looking at uh, the breast as something that could be cut off. And also, um, one of the things that comes up with breast cancer is because the thing about women's breasts is that they can give milk, which makes them seem like, like a strangely magical object so to have the picture of you breastfeeding on the top is like oh and that was actually tonight last night i i kept ending up in groups of women talking about their breastfeeding experiences i do feel like they just stopped noticing that i wasn't a woman last night because uh, they were all, all sharing the stories as if i was one of them he's fascinated 
Yeah. Well, it is fascinating. But you, you know, it's like, because you were crediting Steve with letting you sleep through the night. So. Yeah. Um, everybody knows if you're really lazy and don't want to clean up and get a bottle, a good man will lift up your shirt, put the baby on, feed it, burp it, change it, and you don't even have to wake up. Yeah. He didn't know you could really do that. He yeah. thought I was making it up. But. Yeah. I also had both of your sons last night tell me that was them in the photo. They're kind of proud of that now. Yeah. So I was just like, I'm not going to, I'm not going to say which one oh. it is. Oh, so the little one thought that was him as well? Yeah. I, I, it was. It is same. It is. Yes. It's both of my it's children, both of the children in that same once. picture. Breastf breastfeeding. Both told you that's sweet. They both told me, that's me, you know, so <gasps> it was so cute last night. Um, okay, so you, um, you start looking at this history of breast, the iconography. One of my favorite parts of the show are the trays. Um, for those of us who are art history nerds, there's a really great... Uh, of martyr, Renaissance martyr painting tradition of St. Ag Ag Agatha, who was martyred by having her breasts cut off, and she's always depicted holding her breasts on a tray. And if you just Google, there's hundreds of incredible art historical images of this. 1500s, it'll blow you away. Yeah. yeah. So you started painting, those are all actual friends' breasts. It's easier for me to figure out color palette to just kind of pick a friend, I'm like, okay, my, my psychiatrist who's from Lebanon, okay, her nails, her hair is that, okay, I bet I know what her breasts look like. Um, it just helps, and then they'll come over and they'll be like, are those my boobs? Yeah, yeah. and you all say yes. Yes. Yeah, uh, yeah no, I, I, I love the Trey series, just because for art history, they're so fascinating. And then tell me about the mirrors. Um, well, it kind of solves the problem if you're brushing your teeth and you're still worried about your boobs not being there. You can just kind of line up yourself in the morning and, you know. It, yeah. We try to hang these at all different heights yeah. so that everyone could add boobs on. So men can experience what yeah. it's like if you want to check it out, you know. Yeah. And you also did a uh, project that is on sale downstairs of boob t-shirts. So, because one of the uh, things we keep hearing is that, well, men don't really know the psychology of breasts. Men don't know this incredible tie. So, if you're a man, you can go downstairs. I've got one of the shirts. In the catalog, we have a very famous Texan named Colby Keller modeling the shirt in the, in the book that will be out in two weeks, I think, uh, or three weeks. Um, so, there was a lot of these sort of sympathetic pieces going on. One of the things, w the show was a little more tilted to the early work. And I had some of your collectors last night um, give me a little piece of their mind for the fact that they really hoped their paintings were going to be in because more. But you started having this really rich period in the last year and doing paintings like that. Thank you. It's, it's brand new. So he asked me about it yesterday, and I just froze up because you, you have to get them out there, and you have to think about them. Um, their words aren't there yet. So I need a feminist writer to help me out here, but you got to read really carefully at the to-do list. It says feminism, find it, or something, yeah. you know? So I can't give you an answer what this is about yet, concretely, but give me two weeks. Well, and it's, it's the scar, it's the breast, it's, it's the surgery scars in the bottom. Is it your grandmother's kitchen? Uh, one very, very similar to hers, so yes. Similar to and the doll, you, if you also look behind there, there is, um, a bunch of dolls that have had their breasts ground down. Yes, I am um, trying to do therapy. Basically, this is all just therapy. I want to thank y'all for being my shrinks. Um, I took my grandpa's grinder and ground the shit out of my dolls, and that was really fun. Yeah. And then there's another doll body. And is that the young Phaedra in the bathtub? It is. And if you look closely, what's great is um, I kind of feel like I have the body that I had when I was six. So 40 years kind of got taken off my life. And so I get to just kind of feel like I'm six again. I have tea parties in my studio and yeah. shit. So. Yeah. Well, I mean, also, it's like with, with so much discussion about uh, what trans bodies means, the idea of the post mastectomy female body is another really interesting variable in that discussion. Uh, and also, I should say that um, Thader is opening a second show tonight at Nicole Onnicker's gallery, which is on Cold Kid, but I don't know the address. Uh, 26. 26, and that's opening at 5 p.m., 5 to 8. And it's, up, it's open now if they want to go see it, right? And it's more of the big paintings. And it's also with another artist who's also doing work about breast cancer. 
Can you talk a little bit about what you're showing tonight? So uh, my project's called the Oh, maybe introduce yourself. Oh, okay. Sorry. <laughs> so um, I'm Sharice Isis, and I'm the photographer of a project called Grace. And um, I have photographed um, throughout the U.S. over 220 women so far who have had mastectomies as a result of breast cancer. And um, they're empowering portraits. They're printed onto um, large format pieces of silk. And... Um, you know, I base the portraits um, on Hellenistic sculpture with the idea that, um, you know, the Venus de Milo um, survived the trauma of history, and in the process, she um, lost body parts, and yet we still value her as this ultimate uh, cultural icon. So um, those images are going to be showing at um, Nicole Longnecker Gallery, and we'd love to have you um, join us. And I actually photographed... Sadra for the project, and her portrait is um, hanging. <laughs> so, so you get to see a portrait of Sadra that I did. So it connects the two shows really beautifully. Yeah, great. So thank you. Okay, so, maybe, yeah. so I'm going to ask um, for those of you. I know a lot of you were here last night for the performance, but for those of you who weren't here, um, the there was two the biggest boob piñata I'd ever seen. When we were discussing the performance, I was like, yes, make it as big as the poor woman can fit out of her door. Uh, and there was a woman last night, uh, Zura, Zura, Zuri? Zuri. Zuri, a performer, and she came out. She had her mastectomy at 22, I think you said? 21? 21, And, yeah, and so she, uh, she didn't have the, uh, the mask on, so it was, she just started beating the crap out of it. And then I did not, none of us knew this was going to happen. Another woman who had had a mastectomy ripped her shirt off and grabbed the other stick, and the two of them just went to town on this, and it was so intense. And it was about all this sort of anger, and, but also funny, too. A, you know, a, a boo piñata is funny uh, in a lot of ways. And then when it started going... Sex, life, and death is yeah. funny. Yeah, I mean, it's the big stuff in life. The candies that come out, a lot of which have the words fuck cancer written on them. It's, tell me about the percentages of the black to the pink. Um, well, it's one in eight women. And so if you see a black candy, you've got, I'm not good with math. Help me out, Stephen. Where is he? Yeah. Yes. So yeah. that just helps visually help people out. Yeah. It is, it's to think that one in eight women will have breast cancer at some point in their life. Next time you're in a big restaurant, think about that. Look around and think about that number. Yeah. And, and also one thing, one thing it's, uh, uh, because of working the project and also another friend of ours got a breast cancer diagnosis um, recently. So I've been reading a lot. Uh, there are a lot, of, there's a lot of progress being made and they're getting better at genotyping types of breast cancer getting more targeted uh, immunotherapies for it, but it's still a huge killer and a huge uh, d uh, lifestyle issue. But, and I, but I see that a lot more community, like what you joined here, is uh, forming around breast cancer. What are the pieces of paper in here too? Yeah, uh, Flat and Fabulous is this group online and in the middle of the night when you're freaking out, you can always find someone you know, across the world to talk with. And I, I encourage everyone to come read one of these um, I blocked out the names, but we talk about everything. And um, so it's the conversations you had with women. These from are Gladys my Fabulous. are online. Yeah, this is what keeps us going. You know, a doctor telling her that she would be in trauma if she woke up and she was flat. And then we dis we then we list things like he's an ass hat. And um, <laughs> really, you know, it's very it's 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 good. And I love that, that, that now it's just sort of this beaten up piñata that hangs here. And That's exactly like, how it really feels. Yeah. Um, now that this body of work has been out there to this degree, like, like one of the, it's like when you show, you tend to show pieces in multiple places. Like there's uh, the piece you referred to just briefly before of um, the jello filled pool. She was telling me that she showed that uh, three times in three months when it was first shown. And poor Stephen, uh, the long suffering husband, had to keep pouring um, bleach. bleach on the top we were, to keep yeah. it from mildewing. It was at the Art League, and we were driving from Austin every two nights, and he would spray it down. Yeah, yeah, don't, we don't need to go there. Yeah. 
So, um, <laughs> but that is one of the reasons we don't have, we did not recreate that piece for the show. It seemed like it would be a, a little bit of a health hazard for a general public audience. Um, so, uh, one of the things about the show is this, as well as people telling me about their breastfeeding stories, everyone's been coming up to me, people I don't know, and telling me their cancer narratives. They're like, oh yeah. Uh, and it's one of, the, it's, it's fascinating. We have a book out now and people are telling cancer stories because you see the show and almost everyone has some sort of experience with this. So what is your, I mean, because you, uh, you're talking a little bit about the way people tell you their stories now. What's been the most powerful thing you've heard? Oh my goodness, last night, as, as soon as it was over, this really beautiful girl in this um, white sundress, did anybody see her last night, came up to me and she said, I was just diagnosed with, um, I can't think, coochie cancer, I can't think of the technical word, and she goes in next week and I said, you friend me on Facebook, I will be there for you, and um, just, yeah. you have to. No, it's, it's a fascinating, I mean, because it's, it's really part of being involved with life. 